one of the struggles we can all have in life is trying to figure out what to believe. You know, this world is full of all sorts of things people proclaim as the truth, and I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, my trust is not in humankind, in, in mankind, because, you know, some things that we might even think as a truth it ends up not being the truth. You know, the only one that I, I find great comfort in, in believing is, is God. And what he declares is the truth, because when he says it, it, be, it is the truth. You know, so I, I started out titling this, What to Believe. But then I struggled with it a little bit, and there's also another title in here that uh, I wanted to put on there, and it's, Do You Have Pretty Feet? You know, <laughs> it's kind of different, isn't it? You know, and it's not what you think, but, you know, you hear that, and I don't know about you, but feet are one thing that I'm like, nah, we're not going to go there. <laughs> I felt sorry for my dad years ago because he was in one of the uh, service. You know, he was a, a minister, and, and they brought all the ministers up front in the church, and they made them sit in front of everybody, and they stripped their shoes and their socks off, and they did a foot washing ceremony. And if my dad could have, he would have crawled underneath the chair he was sitting on because it was just so embarrassing for him. But, you know, the, the question is, is, you know, do you have pretty feet? And we'll get back to that in a little bit here, so just be thinking about that in a minute here. But uh, if you would, uh, let's, we're, we're in the, the epistle to the Romans. Uh, uh, if you would, turn with me to Romans. And we've made it all the way up to chapter 10. You know, Paul has been laying out a case of what we need to believe in the, in the book of Romans. You know, we, we've seen uh, and experienced that if you've been here the entire time. If not, you can go back and watch the videos and, and we discuss these things. But, you know, uh, one thing that Paul does is he establishes the fact that humankind is lost. You know, in, in our own abilities and in, in, in just our sinful nature, we are lost. And what that means is, is we've fallen short of the glories of God. We, you know, we are not going to spend eternity with him because we are sinful human beings. That's what was lost in the Garden of Eden was eternity. Man became mortal. Before that, man did not know death. Man did not know separation from God. And that's what came into our existence back there in the Garden of Eden. Our great-great-great-great-grandfather, Adam, and, our, and Grandma Eve, you know, they, they, they failed God. They, they, they sinned, and that nature was passed down to us. So, you know, in chapter 1 and chapter, all the way through chapter 3, the lostness of humanity he establishes, and it's the, necessi the necessity of God's intervention. You know, uh, mankind is without excuse. God has given us the evidence of him everywhere we look. You know, you look at a baby when they're born, and it just amazes me that people think that that could happen through evolution. There are too many things that point towards God's design there, of how a baby even comes into this world, how it's conceived and how it's born. And then, you know, looking at, you know, people that are having problems with their eyes, you know, the miracle of sight. You know, you look at what it takes for just the, the picture that you and I are looking at right now through our eyes to even happen. It, it, it's the complexity of design is just mind-boggling. But they, God says, you know, the evidence that he is there and, and that uh, man is held accountable for that is established, you know, in, in, in chapters 1 through 3. But the evidence that, that, that man is lost, you know, you, you want to see evidence of that. Look all around this world that we live in right now and how people reject God. And how they refuse to acknowledge him as God and to worship him as God. And God holds us accountable for those things as human beings. But then it goes on to, to, to show us in chapters 3 through 5, the forgiveness of sins through Christ Jesus. God has a plan. He intervened in the, the history of mankind and provided a way for mankind to be reunited back to him. And ultimately, in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. You know, that's something that the, the human 
uh, being needs is because we're, we're constantly looking for peace. We're looking for that which satisfies. And if you go out in this world, you won't find it. You know, people have chased things. We, you know, we're talking about getting into the Proverbs and Solomon. He went out and tried to find satisfaction in all the world's things. You know, we find out in Ecclesiastes that, you know, he figured it out. It was all vanity. You know, and basically what man, you know, the lot of man is to, to basically do the will of God. That, that will satisfy. But we have peace with God, but it's in Christ Jesus. It's not in anything that you and I will ever do. It's not in anything, no pleasures, no, no satisfaction will be ever found in anything that we try and find it in in this world. It will only be found in God himself, in Christ Jesus. But forgiveness of sins. And, and that forgiveness is for our sins, past, present, and future. See, a, a, as a Christian, I know that I'm going to fall. I'm going to fail. But God says, your sins have been paid for. You just need to come back and confess them to me. Because, you know, the thing is, is we think we're hiding from God, but he knows our sins. He knows them before we ever commit them. He knows, you know, that we're trying to hide from him. You know, it's like Jonah. You know, he, he thought he was going to hide from God on a, on a ship going to Tarshish. And God knew exactly where he was. Then, in chapter 6, God has shown us and declares to us the freedom from the power of sin. See, we've been set free from being slaves to sin. The problem is, is our human nature, that's where it lived, and that's what it's accustomed to. You know, habits, they're hard to break, aren't they? You know, when you, sometimes you, when you're not even thinking about it, the, you know, we tend to go back to our old ways. But yet, what God has says, and he declares there, is we've been set free from the power of sin. See, we have a new nature. We have a spiritual nature, but the spiritual nature and the flesh are, are co-mingled here in our bodies. So even Paul, he says he struggled with that. The things he knew not to do, he did. And the things he knew you know, that he wanted to do, he didn't do. And, and that's really a commentary on the human nature. That struggle that you and I all go through. But we've been set free from the power of sin. Then he goes on to tell us about the freedom that we have from the dominion of the law. You know, growing up, I, you know, all I ever heard, you know, growing up was the thou shalt nots and the thou canst nots and those things. Or at least that's all I heard. I'm sure the, the truth was being proclaimed. That's just what my ears heard. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that. But when you see God and, and what he's done, he's set us free especially from the law, because through the law, that's, God gave us the law as, 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 you know, man thinking that, well, if I do everything the law says, I can get back to God. That'll impress God. And God says, no, I give you the law to teach you what sin really is. But we were under the, the tutelage and control of the law before we came to Christ. And it was a teacher. It was teaching us, you can't do it. About the time I thought I was doing okay and that maybe I was going to get, you know, there on my own merits, you know, I would fall. You know, the, the law would say, no, you, you failed right here and then you failed right here. And as the Bible says, if you're guilty on one point of the law, you're guilty of all the law. But ultimately, we find out in, in Romans chapter 8, we looked at that a couple weeks ago, that we have freedom to become like Christ and discover God's limitless love. In, in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, you know, let me read it to you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, the enemy loves to condemn us. Constantly he's there saying, see, you failed again. You call yourself a Christian? Oh, you must not be a Christian. But yet, there's no condemnation when we are in Christ Jesus. So basically, Paul has been setting up for us the things that we need to believe. These are the words of God. 
You know, so, you know, who can we trust? Who can we believe? You know, and you and I, we've said we can believe God. But then that begs the question, and this is where a lot of the world stumbles. What about Israel? God's chosen people. What about them? He, he showed them everything. He, he demonstrated his power to them. He rescued them. But yet they fell. Is God done with Israel? question is asked, but the answer is no, God is not done with Israel. So in chapter 9, we looked at Israel past. You know, and, and God choosing, you know, uh, Jacob over Esau. God choosing Isaac over Ishmael. We looked at those things because they were the children of promise and of, uh, of, of the blessings of God. You know, you, you, you look at that passage that said God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. And that just kind of, it, it's like, I thought God loves everybody. No, see, Esau, he rejected the things of God. And, and it was in the nation of Israel that he was going to demonstrate his love for a lost and dying world. And he chose Jacob. The thing, the idea is not that he hated him like with the hatred that you and I can come up with. It was, you know, that Jacob or Esau had no regards for the things of God, and God put him aside. And that brings us up to the question, what about Israel today? So what about Israel today? Anti-Semitism is, is, is so much prevalent in the world around us, even in our, in our uh, governments. You know, you see the, 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 the disregard for God's chosen people. And, and there's a warning found in God's word for any nation like ours that would disregard the promises of God and his people. Mm -hmm. His promise to Abraham and, and therefore to his descendants, he says, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. You want to do a little research on your own. Look at those nations that have ever turned their back on the nation of Israel and see what happens to them. They fall from power. They become a byword. The only reason our, our nation right now has the blessings of God is, well, there's a couple reasons. One, we haven't turned our back on Israel yet. And two, we are one nation under God. We have, you know, his people here. But if we ever turn our back on God or on his people... We'll suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. But let's dive into this question a little bit more right now. What about Israel? If you've got your Bibles open in chapter 10, let's start out at verse 1, and it says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. Notice it says, you know, here he's saying that his desire still is for his people, but they had a zeal. They were zealous for God, but not God's righteousness. Remember, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Mm -hmm. But Israel, you know, in the time of the Bible, their righteousness, they thought, was found in their power and in their might, in their blessings from God. You know, and, and it wasn't based on knowledge. There's a lot of uh, people in this world that are full of zeal for God but it's not based upon what God says. You, you look at the Muslim world. They have a zeal for God. They think they're doing the will of God himself. But it's not based upon what God says. There are some out there, that, the religions that call themselves Christian, but yet they're basing it upon other doctrines and not being based upon what God says. Same thing with the nation of Israel. They had a zeal. Even Paul, he says, I was zealous for God to the point of persecuting the church. What he thought he was doing right wasn't based upon God's word. It was based upon what they thought God would want. 
Let me read you a passage. This one's found in Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Well, let me read you, starting out at verse 1. It says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do not... Well, that was Philippians. Sorry. I'm like, wait a minute, that don't sound right. Colossians chapter 2. <laughs> My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, we're supposed to have a zeal, but it's supposed to be based upon the knowledge that's found in Christ Jesus. You know, you, you look at what happened during the Crusades. They had a zeal for God. They thought they were going out and doing God's work. But it wasn't based upon the, what God had, had just demonstrated through his son, Jesus. So that was the problem with the nation of Israel. He said, yeah, they were zealous. But it wasn't based on knowledge. And you and I know that that knowledge comes in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. See, that's when you and I, we, we come to that point in our lives, we have to submit to God. Saying, God, your way is right, my way is wrong. See, we, we found out in chapter 9 of Romans that they, they sought to have a righteousness of their own down in verse 30 and, and 31, but it was based upon works. You know, they, they thought they could impress God by what they did. God says, no, the Gentiles have received a righteousness, but it's based upon faith. See, that's what the word is all about, is what do you believe? God, you know, throughout his word it says, it's by faith and faith alone that we will become in right standing with him. Nothing you and I can do. You can't live a good enough life. You can't get enough gold stars on the refrigerator. There's nothing that we can do to earn a righteousness of God. The only thing that we can do is to believe God and what he says. He says, you're a sinner, but you will be saved by grace. And that's God's riches, that's Christ's expense, is how I remember that word, grace. Christ, in verse 3 here it says, or verse 4, excuse me, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The end of the law. Do you know anybody that says, well, you know, we, 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 we need to be back under the sabbatical law? I've known people like that. Or how about the dietary laws? Mm -hmm. You know, well, God must have wanted us to, to observe these things because he said it was important. It was to his nation, to his people. But we're under a new covenant, and Christ is the end of the law. I'm thankful because, you know, I, growing up, I was a miserable person thinking I had to perform to impress God. You know, if, if I missed a Sunday, oh, I, I, I missed the Sabbath. You know, I, I'm thankful, you know, that uh, we're allowed to eat pork because I love my bacon. <laughs> you know, all these things. But, you know, so many people think that, well, maybe, maybe I need to observe this portion of the law to impress God. The reality is, is Christ abolished the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And that's where people stumble. It can't be that simple. I have to do something. No, you start out by believing. 
John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. See, the rest of it is God working in our lives. You know, for us, you know, we're, we're told that you and I were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. We're to become more and more like Christ each and every day of our lives. It goes on, it says, Moses described in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. You know, again, it was all by performance. That's what the Mosaic Law was all about. If you're going to have life, you've got to live by these set of rules. And when you broke one, you broke them all. It was a continual thing. You had to perform. I mean, you think about it. You just got done sacrificing for your sins that you just committed. And you, you're on your way back away from Jerusalem, heading home, and all of a sudden you had a, uh, you know, somebody cut you off, you know, on the path in front of you and you, you, you say something wrong. You know, you, you have a hateful thought towards them and all of a sudden you find out that you've sinned once again. Or maybe you, you get mom, you know, mad at mom and dad because the word, said, you know, under the law says you, you're to honor your father and mother. Maybe you say something against them. You're guilty all over again. So you got to turn around and head right back to Jerusalem and offer another sacrifice. It was a way of life. Let me read this to you. The, this passage right here is found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. It's actually taken directly from there as Paul is quoting. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 11. This is Moses talking to the nation of Israel. And it says, now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? See, everything about the Old Testament was a shadow of things to come. It was pointing towards heavenly things. This passage right here is talking about what Christ did for us. He descended from heaven and brought the word to mankind. Man didn't have to attend or to, to strive to get up to heaven to, to obtain it. See, that's the thing about other religions in this world. You have to do something to obtain righteousness. You have to earn your way all the way up to heaven. That's not what the word says. Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey? It's not, not about you. I mean, you remember during the, uh, the Crusades and stuff, people would go to great lengths to travel, great distances to find truths. For his nation, God brought the truth to them. And he does the same for us. Our truth is found in Christ Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Verse 14 says, No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. The word, the logos of God. See, what makes a difference in people's lives is hearing the word of God. And that was a truth that even Moses laid out for us there all the way back in the Old Testament. You get the word inside of you. When you hear God, it, it gets into your heart. And it, and it changes you. That's what makes a difference in people's lives, not religion. God makes the difference. You get into his word and you read that there's forgiveness of sins. That he offers us eternal life as a gift. That we're in right standing with him because of the sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross. These are things so wonderful. Sometimes they're hard to believe. But it's God's truth. 
And that's what Paul has been trying to lay out in the book of Romans. What to believe. Salvation is found in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You, you might think this passage is like, well, we don't have other gods. We don't worship Molech and all these things, but I can guarantee you this nation is full of other gods. People have careers that they worship. People have, I, I've heard of people going out and actually, you know, kissing their cars goodnight. Oh man, they'll spend hours out there polishing their car. Why? Because they worship that car. It's a status symbol or it's, it's power to them. It's their God. Some people worship food. Some people worship drinks. Some people worship pharmaceutical things. They've become their gods. And ultimately, it will destroy you. But God says, as he continues on, you will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. See, God gives us the choice. He doesn't force himself upon us. But he tells us the ramifications of our choices. Ultimately, for the nation of Israel, guess what they did? They went off and worshipped other gods. You know, oh yeah, they still had the temple. But then as soon as they got in worshiping at the temple, then they went and off and worshipped the Ashtoreths or the Baals or things that were appealing to the flesh. <clears throat> so they had other gods besides God. God says, you will be destroyed. And we know the history of Israel, right? They, they were sent into captivity. They were destroyed. And ultimately, they were scattered among the nations because they didn't heed God's warning. Turning back to Romans chapter 10, let me reread verses 5. In 6, I think that's where we got to. It says, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does <clears throat> these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deeps, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That the word of faith, or that is the word of faith we are proclaiming. It's always been about faith. It's always been a, about the fact that God was going to come down. His word was going to come down. And it's our faith in him that gives us life. It's the faith that he rose from the dead and he conquered the dead or death for us. We no longer have to fear it. And it's faith and faith alone. And it's that word that's inside of us. That belief in what God says. Now, what does God say? He says in verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. To confess. Homologeo is the Greek word. And it's to voice the same conclusion. To agree. Or to align with. If we confess with our mouth. Jesus is Lord. 
If we agree with what God says in this, God said that Jesus is salvation for mankind. He is God. If we agree with that, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, to believe, it's the word pistio, which, or pistio, it's faith. If you have faith in God or put your trust in him. So, it's that with the same voice agree with God to come to the same conclusion and put your faith and your trust in him. You will be saved. That's the word of God. To believe. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to believe in something or someone. But this is what God has said. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Like we talked about last week, in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. And they hid from God. You and I, we don't have to be ashamed anymore. Our sins are covered. We are clothed in righteousness. And that's the promise of God for us. We have been declared righteous. They weren't in right standing with God back there in the Garden of Eden. And they were found to be naked. You and I, we started out naked. We were sinners. And God clothed us in his righteousness. And it goes on to say, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, so what about Israel right now? It's called the age of grace. They have the same opportunity that you and I do to call upon the name of the Lord. In fact, God says that they're going to remain this way until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what the nation of Israel has to confess. But that's also what you and I have to confess. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that name was Jesus. He became, or he came on behalf of the Father to save us from our sins. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Good question. You have to believe in him. Call upon his name. And how can they believe in one that, whom they have not heard? That's what we said. You know, it's, it's by hearing God's word. Throughout the Bible, God, you know, Jesus himself said, He who has hear, ears to hear, let him hear. Do you have ears to hear what God has to say? Not what I'm saying. I might stumble all over my words. I may, I may misquote something. Read it for yourself out of the Bible. This is God's inerrant word. And what that means is he's speaking the truth. And how, or, and how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? You might say, well, that's your job, preacher. No. Preach the word. The term there is to be a herald. To proclaim or to announce the gospel. Can you proclaim the gospel to somebody who's lost? Yes. You know, we're told the great commission to the church is go and make disciples of all nations. We can all be proclaimers or heralds of the word. 
You know, back in the, in the days of the kingdoms, you know, throughout this world, before they had internet and telephones and all that stuff, if the king gave a decree or made a new law, they would give it to the heralds and they would go out and proclaim what the king has said. That's our job now as Christians, is to go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. To become the herald, the preacher of the word. And it says, and then how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You got pretty feet? We're supposed to. It's not for the visual looking. It's the fact that we can rejoice in the message that's brought. You know, in the day that when the, the herald would bring good news, maybe the king says there's no taxes this year. Wouldn't that be good news? <laughs> you would think that herald had some pretty good feet there. Huh? They're pretty. We bring good news, don't we? That you won't have to suffer the second death, which is hell. That you get to have eternal life. Christ Jesus our Lord. That is good news. But it comes by only those who accept and believe the message that's being proclaimed. But not all of the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Faith. You want to have more faith? It comes from hearing God. It's not in what we think that a religious person should look like or what a Christian should look like. It's by what God says a Christian should look like. Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message. Tell people what God has said, not what you think. See, that's the problem. So many... Pulpits are full of people that are going to say what they think instead of what God has said. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. If I ain't preaching this, then I'm not doing my job. If you are not sharing this with this lost and dying world, then you're not doing your job either. But I ask, did they not hear talking about Israel? See, that was the problem. They heard the message. You know, the first time Jesus arrived, you know, at Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, he wept over Jerusalem because he held them accountable for the word. In Daniel chapter 9, we were, the, the nation of Israel was told exactly the day he was going to arrive. From the day that the decree goes forth for the rebuilding of Jerusalem until the arriving of the Messiah was going to be 69 seven-year periods called a week of years. It was going to be 69 weeks. And that happened on the, the day of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you would have only known the day of your visitation. He held them accountable for that. They've rejected the word. They reject Isaiah chapter 53, talking about the Messiah and what he was going to accomplish. It's called the forbidden chapter. They will not read it in the synagogues, even to this day. They reject the word of God. It says there, their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. He's talking about us Gentiles. See, we are saved by grace. We heard the message, and, and it's to make Israel envious because we have the blessings of God that they should have too. See, they're still under a blessing of God, but you and I have a, a, a very special blessing called eternal life. 
But everything that they go, they, you know, they keep going back to Moses. They keep going back to Abraham thinking that their blessings are because of them instead of the blessings that come from God. Yes, they have a blessing because of Abraham. It's a physical blessing. Like I said, just go back and research those nations that have turned their back on physical Israel and see what's happened to them. But as we found out in chapter 9, not all Israel is Israel. See, Isaac was the child of promise. And it was by faith that he was brought into the world. You and I are the descendants of Abraham through faith. We become the spiritual children of God. That's in God's word. He's the one that has declared that, not me. That's how we become sons and daughters of the most high God. We're born from above. And it says, I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. You know, when you start talking about Jesus to, to, the, to the, the nation of Israel, it does make them mad because they reject him. Verse tw uh, 20, it says, And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. God has revealed himself to the entire world. His plan of salvation. And, he's, and, and we're held accountable to that. Back in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, he says, that evidence is all throughout creation. It's all around us, and he holds us accountable for that. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. He has constantly been calling out to his people. He hasn't done with them yet. We're going to find out in chapter 11. God still has plans for his nation. But right now, it, it, it's the age of grace. They have the same opportunity that you and I have to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. As we find out in John chapter 1, verse 11, he says, talking about the word, he says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. But there's a greater promise found in verse 12. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, they too have that opportunity to have that blessing in their lives. See, as Paul has been laying out, the whole world is guilty of sin. Christ paid the debt that we could not pay. He redeemed us back from the dead if we put our faith and our trust in him. And now we've been justified in the eyes of God through Christ Jesus. We don't have to fear God anymore. Nation of Israel, they still got a choice to make. Back there in Deuteronomy chapter 30, that's, it's been laid out before them. Life or death, blessings or curses. And that's the same thing in our lives. Choose which one you decide. God offers life. But if you reject life, you will suffer that second death. Choice is yours. He won't force you to make it. He offers it. The choice is up to you. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, you have been so gracious to us. Lord, I thank you for the offer, for the evidence that you have given us, Lord, for, the, for your word and the truth that is contained therein. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just cause your word to come alive in our hearts, Lord. Lord, give us ears to hear what you have said. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy upon our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will help each and every one of us to live out your promises in our lives. Lord, the, the gift of eternal life. And Lord, if there's anyone here that has not accepted your son, Lord, the, let them just, Lord, surrender to you, Lord, to, to believe in what you've said, that 
The gift of eternal life is theirs if they're willing to accept it. Lord, for my brothers and sisters that are here, that, Lord, as we continue this race that you've laid out before us, Lord, I pray that you'll continually renew us and refresh us by your spirit, Lord, by your promise in our lives, Lord, that it's by faith that we have your, your spirit, Lord, and that, that through your spirit, Lord, that we'll be encouraged and strengthened and emboldened to stand for that truth and to become the heralds you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you and we love you and we praise you now in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Would we'll please take your hymnals.